HD ports, remasters and remakes have become increasingly popular in the modern gaming industry. For many players, it provides a way to play some classics with greater clarity, or maybe experience them as the creators originally envisioned. For others, it's a worrying sign that the industry is running out of ideas, banking on nostalgia over progression in a way that, when abused, only lines up with other exploitative practices like paid day one DLC or predatory microtransactions. Some of these shiny new updates have been met with acclaim though, namely Saints Row 3 and Shadow of the Colossus, and fully-fledged remakes like Resident Evil 2 or Final Fantasy 7 allowed creators to expand upon their original visions. Unbound by the limitations of earlier consoles, they can craft something far deeper and more effective than ever before. Unless we're talking about side quest design, in which case Final Fantasy 7 feels like an MMO from 2006. All this stuff in mind, whilst the easiest route is touching things up, not every texture pack or frame rate focused remaster honors or even builds on its source material. While it should be an easy open goal, some remasters are total botch jobs. Charging players for games so full of technical issues and bad design choices, it's clear they were kicked out the door to cash in on a trend rather than be something a team of creatives actually wanted to go back to. It kind of defeats the whole point of a remaster and makes you wonder why you even bothered. I'm Scott from WhatCulture and these are 8 remasters that made video games worse. Number 8. The Secret of Monkey Island Special Edition Before bashing the Monkey Island Special Editions for their inferior quality to the originals, they deserve a great deal of praise for introducing a new generation of players to so many effing wonderful LucasArts adventures. Followed by remasters of Grim Fandango, Day of the Tentacle and Full Throttle, these are some of the funniest and best written titles money can buy. However, while The Secret of Monkey Island Special Edition and its remastered sequel The Chuck's Revenge brought classic Monkey Island back to the public eye, overall quality was less than ideal, especially for devoted fans. The controls retooled to accommodate Xbox controllers are finicky as hell and do not suit an adventure game in the slightest. All new voice acting, save for Dominic Armato's Guybrush and Earl Bowen LeChuck is much poorer, with many beloved characterizations totally missing the mark. The more detailed cartoon art style didn't feel right either. Despite the original sprites being tiny collections of pixels, they conveyed much more personality than the stilted larger drawings. There's a lot to recommend, namely the better backgrounds and an awesome new score, but you're still better off overall playing the originals. Number 7. Final Fantasy VI on iOS and Android the iOS and Android remaster of Final Fantasy VI definitely isn't the worst Final Fantasy on mobile. That would go to all the bravest, Square's greedy microtransaction fest that is straight up hated by the fandom. No, if we're talking remasters that stick out like a sore thumb and have the most to gain while it would be hard to lose, it's Final Fantasy VI. Second only to Final Fantasy VII as the most beloved entry in the franchise, this thing's graphical butchering was straight up painful to see. Final Fantasy VI was a gorgeous looking SNES title, showcasing some of the most lovingly rendered art in gaming history. When the mobile port was released with all new artwork, it was just shockingly bad. Bland, hand-drawn backgrounds lacked character, and as for the characters, well, their sprites had been quote-unquote cleaned up to look like pixel art, but not really. Against the game's new backdrops, they just looked like out-of-place cardboard cutouts. Like all the mobile ports of older Final Fantasies, everything just looks amateurish. I mean, just look at those menus. Blech. It's like one of those unlicensed versions of a game that you find in a 200 in 1 collection. The most painful thing out of all of this is knowing that someone's first experience of Final Fantasy VI was this. Number 6. Bully Scholarship Edition in July 2007, riding high on the success of their schoolyard hijink simulator Bully, Rockstar announced a remaster to bring the game to a new generation of consoles. Later being ported to PCs as well, Bully Scholarship Edition boasted audiovisual enhancements and more missions, lessons and unlockable items. Sadly though, it was terrible. While the game's audio was admittedly better quality, the graphical enhancements included some baffling changes to character models, Jimmy himself included, which was so off-putting it kinda looked a little creepy. Some of the new lessons were welcome, but nothing felt like a pivotal addition. Worst of all were many technical issues. Scholarship Edition was notorious for running poorly and crashing on older Xbox 360s due to a lack of adequate testing. As for the PC port, it was considered shoddy next to the hardware possibilities of the time. Many of the extra missions were cut from the original PS2 release for not being up to standard in the first place, which was more than obvious when you actually started playing. Some of these would even soft lock the game, making it feel like that original masterpiece is always the way to go. Number 5. Assassin's Creed The Ezio Collection 
Of all the Assassin's Creed titles churned out over the past decade or so, one of the most fondly remembered by fans is Assassin's Creed 2 and its two follow-ups. Despite the gameplay now feeling a little dated and clunky compared to the more refined mechanics of what came after, this was Assassin's Creed at the absolute peak of its popularity. So what better way to celebrate Ezio Auditore's adventures than with the cynical phoned-in remastering of that trilogy? Assassin's Creed the Ezio Collection, while conveniently wrapping all three games into one neat little package, brought nothing new to the table. In fact, it took some things away. Aside from higher res textures in theory, the game in many ways looked worse. Atmospheric effects such as fog and volumetric lighting were missing, causing the environments to lose a lot of their depth. Also, the original game's colour grading had been toned totally down, sacrificing the game's character for the sake of what should have been a broader amount of colour depth. The fact that this collection was locked to 30 frames per second on modern consoles also seemed like a weird choice, as the PS4 and Xbox One could have easily handled and benefited from some slicker 60fps gameplay. Also, if first impressions count for a lot, which they do, that face going viral just looked ridiculous. Number 4. Flashback Delphine Software's 1992 cinematic platformer Flashback was a punishingly difficult yet unique and laudable title. At the time, its methodical puzzling and platforming gave a sense of realism, setting it apart from contemporaries like Mario or Sonic. The game's story was also very well received for its pacing and gradually unravelling mystery. Paul Cusset, Flashback's director, decided to remake the game in the early 2010s, using his new studio Vector Cell, due to interest from fans in seeing the franchise revived. However, Vector Cell managed to do it in just about the worst way possible, stripping away everything that made the original unique and creating an empty platform shooter that was totally forgettable. The remake's platforming was simplified completely, demanding none of the care that made the original so engaging. A heavier emphasis on easier combat turned Flashback into a generic run-and-gun shooter, and overblown 2.5D environments just looked terrible in comparison to the original's hand-drawn backdrops. Not to mention that old-school rotoscoped animation still looks gorgeous today. With an expanded story came some truly bad writing, with a lot of the original plot points revealed early on, and what was once a great mystery totally being lost. Our new reworked protagonist even busted out an awesome source one-liner, immediately dating him to 2013 and not a faraway sci-fi world. All in all, you're more than reminded to play the original instead. Number 3. Tony Hawk's Pro Skater HD once a landmark franchise boasting entries like Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 2 and 3, or the Underground series, after a while the only thing this Hawk was circling was the drain. One final death rattle before the rigor mortis set in was the abominable Tony Hawk's Pro Skater HD, an amalgam of the first two Pro Skaters for PlayStation. A good idea on paper, its execution was terrible. The game didn't feature any tricks or features from later titles, and lacked even basic core mechanics like the park editor or local multiplayer. For newcomers, it felt sparse, clunky and unrefined, its lack of features comparing unfavourably to modern games and the originals simultaneously. As for returning fans, it just felt immediately off, in a way the developers could never recover with any amount of patches. Thankfully, Activision do appear to have learned their lesson and as I record this, we eagerly anticipate the remasters of the first two pro skaters yet again. It would be kinda cool to have a decent Tony Hawk's game within the last decade. Number 2. Warcraft 3 Reforged Blizzard are known for cornering the MMORPG market across the 2000s with the mighty world of Warcraft, but the studio first cemented their status with 2002's real-time strategy, Warcraft 3 Reign of Chaos. Introducing that now trademark chunky art style, Reign of Chaos received universal acclaim for well-balanced gameplay, alongside a simple yet effective interface, making the game enjoyable for newcomers and RTS veterans alike. When Blizzard announced Warcraft 3 Reforged, a remaster of such a seminal title, it was met with a great deal of excitement, promising to make this game more stunning and evocative than ever before. Of course, when it finally released in January 2020, that excitement gave way to pure hatred. Warcraft 3 Reforged was plagued by bugs from the outset, and its changes to gameplay alongside a new, massive, invasive user interface were immediately pointed out. Comparisons to earlier footage used to market Reforged only highlighted how the retail version was now so much different. Worst of all though, Blizzard also patched the original Warcraft 3, including all these newer unwanted features and ruining the experience of something that should have been left untouched. And number 1. Silent Hill HD Collection 
The 2010s were not kind to Silent Hill. But during the seventh generation, back when HD ports of last gen titles were still gathering momentum, Hijink Studios set about bringing Silent Hill 2 and 3 to modern consoles. A brilliant idea in theory, the originals are still stellar to this day, they then messed this up about as spectacularly as anybody could. See, Silent Hill is known for visuals being scratchy and lo-fi, with a thick fog in particular blanketing the titular town, meaning that you have no idea what's up ahead or around the corner. It's kind of the perfect setup for a horror game. That fog's inclusion though, that was a happy accident. The result of the PlayStation hardware not being able to render much in the way of draw distance. The developers realized steering into this problem created a much more atmospheric and intense experience, so it was left and Silent Hill became iconic visually as a result. So what did a new team do with none of those hardware limitations and none of that creative design input? They just removed the fog and film grain entirely exposing a texture-devoid PS1 town now sitting stark on newer systems. Little to no texture or additional modelling work was done, so all we had were dated models and environments without any of that signature charm. Couple all of this with stretched cinematics and re-recorded voice acting, and the Silent Hill HD collection was an embarrassment, fatally undermining everything that made this IP so special. Here is to all the rumours of a full reboot arriving on PS5 and or Xbox Series X. And those are just some remasters that made their games that much worse. Let me know your favourites down in the comments below, and please check out the What Culture Gaming podcast on iTunes, Spotify, or whatever else you can think of. For now, I've been Scott from WhatCulture.com, and I'll catch you soon.